Hi everyone, my name is Joshua Perez Cruitt, and I am one of the MCAT tutors for Shamassi and Academic Consulting. Today I'm going to work with you through a chem phys passage, but before we start, I wanted to share the strategy that I use for chem phys, bio biochem, and psych so sections of the MCAT. In my opinion, these sections are quite similar and very different from CARS, which I approach with a completely different strategy. My goal for both science sections and car sections are to answer all of the questions correctly as efficiently as possible. So if I skim the passage, I'll probably get through it and answer the questions as efficiently as possible. However, I might not get all of the questions correctly um, answered. Whereas if I use a journal publication style type of reading, you know, very nitpicky, I'll probably get most of the questions correct, but I won't finish the test. So in my opinion, neither of these are the best strategies, but they're likely the two styles of reading that you're most comfortable with. So you'll need to practice my strategy to really get the hang of it. When I read a passage, I, I read so that when I get to any of the questions, I know exactly where to go back to in the passage to find the answer. But I don't try to understand and connect literally everything in the passage because there's always way more information in the passage than is actually needed to help you answer those four to seven questions. So I call this reading style the table of contents reading style. And how do I actually do it? Well, a couple of things. So I read slowly and steadily, and I don't reread. Um, and I also read in the present, focusing on the words you're reading rather than trying to draw tons of conclusions or connections or predicting what's going to be said next in the passage. And for those of you that are prone to zoning out and, and who is, uh, make a paragraph summary after each paragraph to answer the question, am I reading actively? This works as a consistent check-in um, on your attention. So you're constantly reminding yourself to read actively. If you can't think of a paragraph summary after you finish the paragraph, then you're, you didn't read actively enough. And note that I'm not asking that you write the paragraph summaries down. I'm just asking you to think of one. So, so that, should, you know, that should help you read actively. And by doing this for each paragraph, you catch yourself pretty much immediately when you start zoning out. So I think that's a really helpful uh, tool for you. And, and finally, so I've told you a little bit about reading the passages. Let's talk about figures really briefly. For figures, I only focus on the figure caption, which might sound you know, kind of scary. And I make sure I understand the caption completely. I don't know about you, but uh, I, I, a lot of my students and myself too are prone to wanting to look at the actual figure first and then maybe reading the caption, maybe not at all. But in my opinion, in, from what I've found, focusing on the caption is the most efficient way of understanding the information you will find in the figure. And that's all you actually need to know to identify if a question is asking you about the figure once you get to the questions. And that's the goal. So now I'm gonna tell you about my question answering strategy for these sections. So I, I, it's so important to make sure you fully understand the question, what the question is asking, even if it means having to read the questions two or three times. And then, then what I do is, is probably the key part of my strategy or brings it all together, is once I've read a question and I understand it, I'll go back to the passage and find the answer to the question. Even if I think it's a discrete question, or even if I think I already know what the answer is to the question. And you know, hopefully I found it for, for discrete questions, I, I won't be able to and, um, and, and that's okay. But once I've done that, I make a prediction based on what I've found in the passage, or if I've had to use prior knowledge of, for a discrete question, I'll, I'll do that. Once I have my prediction, I compare my prediction to the answer choices and choose the one or the, you know, choose the answer choice that best overlaps. So I'm comparing my prediction to the answer choices, not the question to the answer choices, because I've already read the question, gone back to the passage and made a prediction. 
And I'm not comparing the passage to the answer choices. I'm just comparing my prediction to the answer choices and choosing the one, um, you know, that best overlaps. That's, that's pretty simple. Um, I think and a lot, a lot, um, you know, a lot easier than trying to, you know, juggle all these things at once. Then I'll eliminate my other three answer choices using my own logic. This way you've chosen your answer choice and proven it two separate ways, proven that it's correct two separate ways. The first by finding the correct answer, and then the second by disproving the three others. So I think it's a fairly robust way to answer questions correctly. Um, and you also have the efficiency from the way you have approached the passage. And this strategy will not work for every single question. Um, if your prediction isn't an answer choice, then go straight to process of elimination. And sometimes you won't be able to disprove all three of those answer choices. So when this happens, you know, maybe you'll have one or two that you're like, okay, this is definitely wrong, but you get to, you know, two at the end. I always choose the one that most overlaps with my prediction, if that's possible. And I never, 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 never choose a choice that I don't understand at all, because that is, you know, that's a strong temptation for me. So that's basically how I, um, that's how I approach the science sections of the test. So let's actually get into the chemistry in physics passage right now. And, you know, hopefully I'll be able to show you this technique in action. Okay, here it is. So practice passage two. Um, so right, you know, right away, really broad strokes. I noticed this is probably gonna be a chemistry passage. I see these like really complex figures, right? Um, you know, figure one has these crazy structures. I'm a chemistry major, you know, or I, I majored in chemistry in college. I don't recognize these at all. So I think one of the biggest temptations when you get to a chemistry passage on the MCAT is if you see something like this, you immediately panic and you tell yourself, oh, like, I've never seen this before. This is completely foreign. I won't be able to answer this question correctly. And I really want to discourage you from that sort of mentality because that's exactly what the, you know, the test producers um, at, you know, at the AAMC want you to do. They want you to give up because if you give up, then, you know, you, you've gotten it wrong and they found a way to differentiate between students. So, um, you know, even if you don't think you're going to be able to answer um, a chemistry question because, you know, it's such a complex, you know, it's something you've never seen before. It's that sort of thing. Don't let that discourage you. You probably, you know, the mentality you should have is, you know, I've done all this prep for, um, you know, for the MCAT. I've, I've read all of this, um, you know, I've, I've studied all of this orgo, all this gen chem, I probably do know the answer. So, so go into it thinking that you do know the answer, even if it's something that looks a little unfamiliar to you, like this one. So that's just like, you know, that's, that's something I think of right off, off the bat. Okay, so let's, let's go into this passage, actually. Um, and I'm going to read slowly and steadily, no rereading. Um, and, you know, figures and not trying to make all those connections, right? in reading in the present. And then for figures, I'm really just going to read the caption. Okay, let's do it. Um, ses sesquiterpene lactones, I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it, are a subclass of isoprenoids with many known bioactivities frequently found in the Asteraceae family. In recent years, researchers have determined the biosynthetic pathway of the core backbones of many STLs. In a new series of studies, researchers are aiming to discover decorating enzymes that can modify the core skeleton with functional hydroxy groups. Okay, so basically this paragraph, you know, I'm thinking it, it has something to do, or, you know, the most important thing is they're talking about these STLs and, you know, their structure can be modified. So I'm going to keep going. So that was my, my um, you know, my past, my paragraph summary, excuse me. Investigators in a novel study used in vivo pathway reconstruction assays in heterologous organisms such as Saccharomyces 
cervicae, or um, I'm pretty sure that's yeast, in Nicotinia benthamiana, I've never heard of that, to analyze several cytochrome P450 enzyme genes of the CYP71AX subfamily from Helianthus anus clustered in close proximity to one another on the sunflower genome. Researchers found that one member of this subfamily, CYP71AX36, catalyzes the conversion of costunolide to 14-hydroxy costunolide. The chemical structures of costunolide in common derivatives are shown in figure one. Okay, so basically what I'm, what I'm um, reading in this paragraph is now they're talking about a specific, um, you know, this specific molecule, costunolide and its derivatives. So, um, you know, in, in the enzyme that can modify it. Okay, so I get to the figure. I only focus on the figure caption, right? This is key to my, my strategy. So, costunolide in common derivatives. That's literally it. That's all I do. So, you know, try to, try to recreate that caption, all the information that caption contains by first looking at the figure and tell me how much time it takes you, how much longer it takes you to, you know, go backwards and reconstruct that. I'm not even gonna look at this figure right now. Okay, next paragraph. The catalytic activity of CYP7, I'm not even, I'm gonna stop reading the whole thing, may be, may be of use for chemoenzymatic production of anti leukemic 14 hydroxy costunolide derivatives and other STLs of pharmaceutical interest. The chemical reaction is shown in figure two. Okay, so, so now we're getting to, you know, this pharmaceutical interest. So this is an application of this enzyme. Um, now I'm going to go to figure two, excuse me, and I'm just going to read the caption. Costunolide converted to 14 hydroxy costunolide via CYP 71 AX 36. Okay, so let's just pretend, let's, let's look at this figure for now. Um, does the figure itself tell you any more than what is told about the figure by the caption? The only thing I can see is this plus O. So, you know, you know oxygen was used in some form. Um, so, so you see that the figure caption contain almost all the information of the figure indefinitely enough where that if you get asked about it, if I get asked about it, I'll be able to, um, you know, identify, oh, I got to go back to figure two for this. Okay, let's do um, the last paragraph. So researchers also probe the reactivity of terminal alkene group of the terminal alkene group present on 14 hydroxy costunolide. Um, okay, so that would be, you know, this thing up here now that I've seen the figure. Um, and the researchers formed SH adducts using glutathione or cysteine. So, you know, basically they're probing reactivity in this, um, in this paragraph where they're talking about that. So, you know, I've, I've gone through the passage now. I've, read slowly and steadily it might have sounded like I was reading really quickly but that's because I was saying it out loud but you know when you don't have to read out loud um it will it will feel a lot slower so you know read at whatever feels like a slow pace for you where you can actually focus on the present in um you know the entire time and then also you know that figure caption strategy I think is super important um, okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna go to the you know the the question answering part. Remember, I always go back to the passage, and I do this for for some reasons. Um, a lot of my students, when they get passage based questions wrong, they they often tell me you know oh I thought it was a discrete question, but it actually was you know I was supposed to use the passage, but I didn't know that I was supposed to use the passage. Or another really um, popular problem is I use the wrong reasoning um, to, you know, to answer a question, or I, I chose the answer choice with 
slightly wrong reasoning. So if you go back to the passage to find the answer choice first, you're, you're much less likely to fall victim to either of those approaches. So always prioritize the passage to, um, to guide your answer prediction over your discrete knowledge. Only use your discrete knowledge when you've ruled out that there's anything in the passage to help you. Okay. So number one, a researcher uses IR spectroscopy to measure the progress of the reaction shown in figure two. So I'm gonna have to go back to figure two. Which of the following peaks will appear in the product spectrum without being present in the reactant spectrum? Okay, so first of all, before I even answer this question, I wanna make it clear that um, you, should, you should definitely understand IR spectroscopy, but for me, the actual specific absorbances of IR spectroscopy are fairly low yield. And there's only a couple that most places recommend or you know, most MCAT prep companies recommend you should know. And that is the OH stretch. Um, which is about a 3,300, you know, per centimeter or CM to the negative one, that, that frequency. So, so that is the stretch that is absorbed for the OH functional group. And then 1,700 um, CM to the negative one, that frequency is, um, is absorbed most you know, that, that is the one that is best absorbed by the carbonyl or the, you know, this, a C double bonded to an oxygen. So I'm, I'm looking for those two primarily for, for IR. Um, okay. So, so now I'm going to go back to the figure in, and see if there's a, you know, a difference between these two. And, and I'm particularly looking for a, an OH group or a, you know, a double bonded O group. And I want to look for something that is, is present in either the product or the reactant and not present in the other thing. So let's just compare these two figures. Um, both have this functional group. Both have the exact same thing here. But this one doesn't have an OH group here. And this one has an OH group. So it's going to be, my, my answer prediction is, it's going to be a wavelength in the 3300 um, CM to the negative one region because that is where an OH stretch is gonna be. Um, so that's my prediction. Now I'm gonna look at my answer choices. So A fits perfectly there. Um, in answer choices B, C, and D do not. They're outside of that range or they don't include 3,300 CM to the negative one. And I don't know too much about the narrow or broads. But, um, you know, I know C and D are probably referring to a C double bonded to an O, you know, the stretch of that bond, and that's present in both of these. So I can, I can eliminate that. So my answer choice is going to be A for this one. Okay, let's go to number two. Which of the following costunolide derivatives is also a dial? So um, the derivatives were talked about in that first figure. Remember, I just read the caption for that and it talked about the derivatives. I didn't go any more into that figure until I've been asked to by a question. And um, in a dial is a functional group that you should be familiar with for the MCAT. It's a little bit um, lower yield than carbonyls or alcohols or um, you know, alkenes and alkynes maybe, but a diol is a di, and then what they really should do is put a, pre or a, you know, a dash and then ol, because a diol is two alcohols, or, you know, two alcohol functionalities on one, um, on one molecule. So let's see which one of these has two OH groups. Okay, so taraxic acid is right here. And so this is going to be, you know, R1, R2, R3, R4. Those are going to be um, different for the different derivatives. So there's no OH groups in taraxic acid. So I can, you know, I can eliminate that one. Um, let's, yeah, let's, let's actually see which of these have two OH groups. You know, I'll make my prediction. Okay, so this one does. 
Okay, so, you know, compound five has one. Compound seven has two OH groups. So I'm guessing it'll be that one. Um, this is, so this is the only compound, or this is the only derivative of costunolide that has two OH groups. You know, R, both R1 and, I'm um, sorry, both R2 and R4 have OH groups. So you see for even, even me, my natural tendency is to start by using process of elimination. But you see how much faster it was for me to just look through these and find the one with two OHs instead of trying to eliminate four separate ones. So I'm going to, I'm going to choose this one. If I see it, this eight beta, and of course, yeah, it's right here. So these are three of the other derivatives, but, um, you know, this was the only one I, this was the only one with a dial group. So I'm already done with that. Which of the following functional groups is not found in costunolide? Okay. So I'm going to go right back up to the structure, um, for this one. Super simple. Um, here it is. So it's asking me which of the, you know, which of four choices isn't um, found in this molecule. So I actually think for this one, predicting is not the best strategy because I could predict, you know, a number of different ones. So I'm just going to look at these three ester, you know, this is an ester here, this double bonded O, and then another O that's bound to an R group. So there is an ester. An alkyne is a triple bond. There are no alkynes, so that's probably the correct answer. Carbonyl is a C double bond into an O, it's right there. And alkene is a C, C double bond right here. So the correct answer for that one is alkyne. Um, finally, researchers discover an active site in E78L CYP mutation that prevents the enzyme from converting costunolide to 14 hydroxy costunolide. Which of the following best describes the change in amino acid properties at position 78 in the enzyme mutant? So this is the position right here. Um, in this sort of notation is super high yield, super important, where they, you know, they give a letter pertaining to an amino acid, and then it's position number, and then another letter. This is the wild type letter. In this is the mutant letter. So it's changed from E to L or glutamate to leucine. Um, I don't think there's any information in the passage. I mean, I'm gonna go quickly back. So, you know, this was about the pharmaceutical interest. This is about, I'm looking specifically in the places the enzyme was mentioned. This is, you know, this says what it, what the enzyme does. So there's nothing in the passage to help me answer this question, which I suspected. This is a discrete question. Um, the residue is changed from E, which is glutamate, to L, which is leucine. Glutamate is an acidic or negatively charged amino acid. And leucine is a, um, you know, a nonpolar or um, hydrophobic residue. So I'm going to be looking for, you know, glutamate to leucine. Um, so, you know, something like acidic to hydropolar or negatively charged to hydropolar. Um, sorry negatively charged to hydrophobic, excuse me. Um, okay, so answer choice A, positively charged. Nope, because um, glutamate's negatively charged. B, hydrophobic to hydro, nope, because um, glutamate is negatively charged, acidic. Aromatic, glutamate's not aromatic, but glutamate is in fact negatively charged. So um, you know, I'm gonna choose answer choice D. And then I can just look back at these to make sure they're, um, they're incorrect. And yeah, so, you know, leucine isn't negatively charged. Leucine is hydrophobic, but glutamate isn't hydrophobic. So, so we're good. And, you know, that's, that's pretty much this whole passage. So it didn't take me that long to, um, you know, to actually go through the passage, even while giving a lot of commentary because of my passage strategy. So definitely try it out if you think it makes sense for you. All right, that's pretty much it. If you enjoyed the walkthrough, be sure to like this video and also subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss out on our future MCAT videos, which you know that, that might include me going through a CARS passage and giving my strategy, my, my complimentary strategy for that section. Be sure to also check out our high yield strategies in our MCAT 528 series, which are also going to complement the strategies I give you, or you know maybe you'll you'll like those a little bit better. And click on the link in the description to sign up for practice questions, so that you can get every last bit of practice in 
before test day. Happy studying. Bye.